I take a void and fill it. My mind reels through imagery. The canvas is a door, glass to be looked through, and the viewer is the only active component. It reassures. Contradicts. Promises. illuminates. When I approach the canvas in total freedom, I see creation. The thing I remember about the farm is when I came into that area, I came down a hill, all the way down to the valley. And if you stayed on that road and just went straight into the bend, you wound up in his drive. We had a little grocery store. And where you saw Dad, you saw Billy, because he'd have him on his back. And uh, they'd have spoiled him rotten just rotten as he could be. But he was still a good kid. He had that smile that you don't forget. You know, and as he got older, he'd wink at you. You know how he'd wink? He'd see you and he'd wink. It was a big snow, and how he carried it in Mom and Daddy's house, I don't know. But he did. Nighttime came, that calf never came to. We all had to go to bed. My husband carried the calf into the bathroom. And I had to go to work the next morning, early, early, before daylight. And that calf came out of it and started bawling. And it needed to use the commode, but it didn't know how to use it. And it went all over the bathroom. I'm telling you. <laughs> came to Kentucky for what was going to be just a few weeks, a summer. And I, I sublet my apartment, and, and then, you know, 20 years went by. <laughs> well, I met Bill through Tom Brown. Um, we were on a series of shoots that took place at night. We were doing commercials for a supermarket. And I'd say Bill had a big influence on me in that he helped me look at things from a unique perspective. Oftentimes I'd ask him about his work and I'd say, well, what does that mean or what's that all about? And he'd never really give me a straight answer he or a direct answer. He would say, uh, well, what do you want it to mean or what do you think it means? So many people were so drawn to Bill and I, I think I've said that uh, everybody wanted a piece of Bill, but not in a bad way, you know. I mean, uh, I, when he told me he was going to move to Greece for a while, I immediately felt like, no, don't leave here. I want you here. In my heart, I would hope that Bill would be like Van Gogh, the great Dutch painter who was not so deeply regarded or well known in his lifetime, but through who, through presentation of his works and through the diligence of friends like yourself, became far better known and known for the passion 
by which he could make the paint uh, tell the story. Back when he was young, not knowing where he wanted to work or what he wanted, where he wanted to live, he must have said to himself, I, I love my mom and my daddy so much, I'd just like to be as close to them as I could. The world's sweetest mother. And I want that crow again, because that was one of the more interesting ones. <laughs> what else we got there? Uh, I don't know, Dad. Uh, this looks familiar. This looks like one of your famous rabbits, only that one's got a spot on the back of it. Oh, yeah. I, perhaps it's a spotted rabbit? Spotted rabbit. Yes, we've got more. Now, this is different and also very interesting. Baby chick. That's a rat. It says rat. It says rat. Rat. Well, I see what this is. Enjoy this day. Happy Easter. That's it. And so, there was an old shed of a building in the hollow with hay in it. The first day I walked in his house up here, a groundhog was going through the wall. There was no floorboards. It was like, my God, Billy, you don't want to live here. You surely you don't. Yes, I do. He says, I'll take care of it. It'll be just fine for me. And he went down there and built a couple rooms on it, put a chimney on it, made it warm enough, and had a cistern for water, and he made do. I think he took after Mom and Daddy. He was a hard worker. I think he was tickled with what he had. I think he took what he had and made the best of it. I don't think he sat around dreaming about a new car, a new suit, a new shirt, a new pair of shoes. I think he was happy the way he was because the people he was around, they had fun together. He was happy. He was happy to go to Mason post office and get a few stamps and send a few people a letter. The big thing about going to Bill's joint was you'd work your tail off and you'd sweat like a pig, you'd feel like you were sitting on top of the world. And then you'd go to the house, and everyone would gather around the kitchen table, and we'd all sit down and have supper together. We had nice meat. We had nice chicken. We had nice pork. We had plenty of potatoes. We had corn, green beans, peas, carrots. You name it, tomatoes. Tomatoes? That's a new plum jelly. Butter. Plum butter. Of course, they're corn. These are very good apples. And they delicious pies. Apple salt. Very handy. And Bill's father did most of the cooking. His, his mom were, was a realtor, and she would come home and uh, off go the day's stories, you know, what she did, what we did, what his dad did. And his father always sat in the same chair. Everybody always sat in the same chairs. Even when I was there, I had my own chair. And, and Melina in particular stands out with me. Such a warm, loving, independent woman. Busy day down here in town? A little bit slow. Everybody's dragging that thing too much turkey, they say. Bill's dad cooking dinner with big, with big cups of stout coffee. You know, and all the food go around the table. It was great, man. It was like what America should be. Everyone always welcome. Actually, you know, uh, and I, I'd like to share this. I remember the call when, when Bill was called back to the hospital to be there when his mother died. And at first Bill said, oh no, no need to come with me. But, but, um, but later he called back and said, could you please come? And so Bill and I sat in the room and it was once again, um, Bill's richness of telling the story. Bill and I sat with, in the room with his mother after she had died, waiting on the rest of the family. And his mother 
when she learned to paint and his mother as a young woman in rich these incredible images of his mother on horseback once again Bill's ability to weave a story that told so much um, within 15 minutes I, I, I knew more about his mother than as if I'd known her for a lifetime all of his stuff was always in the same vein you know it all had it all had that sort of clarity to it is what I would say and it was narrative work it told a story when I was uh, really young I always wanted him to paint like Norman Rockwell <laughs> I always remember that I was like why aren't yours as real as this and then as I got older I really got to appreciate his style and uh, many of his paint paintings would have a statement behind them and the humorous aspect of it always got me like the one his mother's gonna sell his sister to the band of gypsies for a string of pop beads I guess at one point my grandmother would tell Billy that my aunt was going to trade him to the gypsies for a string of pop beads and um, would scare him half to death, I guess, threaten him with a story. Oh, he's out there. I was an artist and I was a little bit more of the classic art. He was definitely a country artist and he was good. I learned about other things in art that you would feel instead of just see. There's always funny stuff to it. And then his style is very cartoony and interesting to look at. The most boring work is where the painting doesn't say anything, and Bill's work always said something, at least to me. There was always a little twist, something that actually took place in his life for the most part. I think Bill's paintings are about memories and stories and about lessons in life. They were about philosophical issues and what really matters. And then again, they were about tremendous fun. <laughs> I kind of like to have people over that are kind of stuffy and look at his art. Because <laughs> it shocks them. Now, some of them don't have the courage to say anything about it. <laughs> They'll talk to somebody else when they leave the house. But I know it shocks them, and that's good. I mean, I, I wanted to do that. You know, that's what Bill wanted to do. Uh, Dog Thief, which is a, a painting at the Morris Museum, they had purchased a piece of his work and uh, it was a, a naked man running with a, a, a collie pup. And there were a couple people behind that where you could tell they were screaming and realizing the loss. I, I always liked that. That was, that was a nice piece of work. My time with Bill, he was, he was very much into stories. And you know, that's one of the things that draws me to Bill's work still so much after all these years is that uh, ability to communicate very personal simple sometimes stories and some other very very complicated with symbols that I do not understand and I don't have Bill here to to uh, ask him. Knowing how Bill's parents death affected him uh, I, I think I, I, can, I saw a, a turn in his artwork to, to themes more spiritual after after their death. There's in particular a painting that, that really touched me was the the eyes watching down from heaven and the hands. I really feel like that was influenced by Bill's belief that there really were people there watching over him. And my belief that Bill continues to do that for me. He wanted to talk to people and he was telling people things on the canvas. He wanted to talk to people, it seemed to me like. One of my favorite paintings is hanging here in the house and it's a painting of Jonas Salk discovering the vaccine to polio. And it's uh, got pictures of stars in the painting. It captures this magical moment when something incredible was happening. There's a painting that uh, he did from a photograph. And we had gone out together and we bought a palm tree. We were planting it in the front of these jealousy windows. He painted this painting of he and I dropping this palm tree in the front yard of that house. And then the reflection of those jealousy windows, he had old Gussie, which was an older black lady from Alabama that lived across the street from me. And he had her in the reflection of the window sitting on her porch, which she always was. And of course, he was inspired mostly by the, the area that he lived around here. He would look out his window and he would create from that. And it would be different every time because it's so amazingly beautiful out here. In many ways, I guess a visit to the farm was much like his art. There was a tremendous connection between 
the land in life. A lot of times it would be places that he had visited, in particular Greece. That really seemed to inspire him more than anything else. A lot of his paintings would be of different areas of Greece that he'd been to. They might be based on a photograph or a set of photographs or just for memory of a place he had been. And then the West also inspired him quite a bit. He, drew, he made a lot of paintings of the mountains and you know the lakes and the wildlife there. Uh, my partner and I got to go west and actually were in valleys and areas that looked just like this. <laughs> and that inspired us to get this piece from Bill. It was a special time for us to be vacationing out there, so this was, it was great to have Bill be part of that by having painted this scene. So he, it's like he was kind of with us at the time. Bill's favorite artist was uh, Gauguin. That's what he always told me. And my favorite artist was always Van Gogh. He worked fast like both of those fellas did. You know, I see in Bill's work a lot of influence of Henry Faulkner, you know, and, and, and I don't even remember how well they knew each other. And, uh, but I see certain things in Bill's paintings that are inescapable as being influences of Henry Faulkner, and I never knew at the time how much they communicated with each other. He was prolific. I mean, he, he would paint boom, 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 boom. He never thought too much about it. One of his paintings that he did, in particular, that means a lot to me, it, uh, I think about the energy that Bill had about him, uh, the kind of electric, kind of cosmic energy that he must have emitted in his life that would draw people near. And the to be happy is to make others happy and to have a little heaven down here. Another one of my favorites is uh, a painting called Storm Coming. I remember when I first visited him and saw it hanging in his kitchen, there's a young man and he's running down the street and lightning bolts are in the sky. And again, it seems to capture this moment when something unusual or over the top is about to happen. I always noticed there was this uh, theme um, of electricity and stars in a lot of his paintings and I always thought it was so cool that uh, he would capture this moment, just this split second in time when something was electric uh, about what was going on in the painting. And I think this painting in particular of him as self-portrait is interesting in that I think it just captures the kind of energy that he had about him that would draw people near. So I like the way the colors evolved because he definitely went on to more vivid colors, more vibrant colors as, he, as his career advanced. After he started going to Greece, his productivity just really multiplied. He started doing a whole lot more work then. After that, it just seemed like the pictures were just bouncing out of him. He was having a good time. He was doing stuff from, he had a passion for Greece, and so he could really capture some of the neat things that he um, felt there. There's another painting that uh, I think might have been one of his last paintings, um, or toward the latter part of his life. St. Elvis on the burning train, and it shows Elvis in a train car playing a, uh, a, one of his records on his lap. And again, they're, they're small, this time pinpoint stars and a moon, and um, it's pretty fantastic. It was interesting. It was Bill's interpretation of Elvis, uh, very artful. Just curious that the train might be on fire. I think Bill was an artist, and I think the difference between a painter and somebody of Bill's caliber is that. So that, that, that's, that, that's the best compliment I could give him. He, he, had, he had purity of thought and uh, imagination to the point where it took you to another place. When you looked at his work, you went somewhere else. You didn't go to some place you knew. You went to some place you didn't know. In 1976, Bill was commissioned by the Grant County Women's Club to paint a mural for the county. 
It was bicentennial, and they wanted to make a gift to the county that everybody could enjoy, it's to hang in the courthouse permanently for all the people. It was quite a day, the unveiling of the county's first piece of modern art. I remember when I first saw this painting, I thought, well, that is pretty wacky. What is this about? And I was young at the time. I don't know, I might have been eight, eight or nine or something, and I just didn't have any idea what, how Bill might be depicting something that was symbolic. Innocently enough, it, as I understood it later, was to depict the scenery in and around the county and farming and tobacco growing. But apparently one of the, one of the local uh, people decided that this was a very uh, disturbing, controversial work uh, depicting homosexuality. Unless he thinks that's a gay Indian, I guess. I don't know. There's an Indian standing by a tree, which, uh, and his body almost uh, becomes the trunk of the tree. To know that my uncle held his head up high and went on and found it kind of laughable and that the letter ever made it in the paper, I thought was a great um, tribute to my uncle, or I found that very inspiring to know that he could take it all in stride. June 17th, 1993, outed in the Grant County News, finally. Well, after hanging in the courthouse for about 20 years, a self-ordained minister decided he was gonna save the children of the county. He punched a hole in the canvas. I don't think people understand the value at all of, of <laughs> what that piece is worth or would be worth today. I met Bill really in a very interesting way. I was dating a girl, going to UC, kind of figuring out where I was sexually. So I'm working down at Oktoberfest in a beer booth with my girlfriend and a couple other buddies. We're having a, you know, Oktoberfest. Next thing I know, there's this guy. He was charismatic. Well, I think you only had to see Bill's eyes once to know that he was a lover of life. And I think to meet Bill and to see those eyes and, and to see that very powerful uh, spirit that he so obviously conveyed, he was a person who was greatly at ease with himself. My sense of him was that he'd identify as a human who happened to be a gay man, incidentally. Just at the time that I met Bill and going to the March on Washington was a time that all of a sudden my perspective just became magnified geometrically. I mean, the world became a very different place. I mean, he was kind of a provocateur of, uh, of thought, I thought, because he would, he was often time in discussions, throw things out to get a rise out of people. I think many, many, many men who have homosexual attractions and who must deal with the role that that either forces them to play in society or that is projected upon them are often in search of their identity. He was almost like the, the tour guide, that he, he took me through this, this odyssey of, of self-awareness and, and helped me break down many of the, the barriers that I have in my own mind uh, in, terms of, in terms of sex and relationship and sexuality, but in terms of people. And I think Bill had resolved those issues. And I think when people met him, they were attracted to him uh, because he was very handsome, but because also there was very, very clearly a person there. There was very clearly a creative and compelling and engaging individual there who could laugh and smile and cry and talk and feed you and, and, and share with you. Hey, they want you to go take something important. We hung out. We were just, you know, mutual painters, lookers of life. He had his thing, I had mine. We'd get in that little Italian sports car he had, and uh, we'd zip down to the bar, which was a place on Main Street, and we'd go upstairs and we'd have uh, dinner. And he'd smoke his Pall Malls, and I'd have a couple of my vantages, and uh, two guys out for a good time. And I had a good time through the day, which was the the basis of the relation was the, you know, the, the mental telepathy of it all, you know, this uh, soulmate kind of thing. He was a, my best friend, that's what he was. To me, he was this incredible uh, contrast, you know, this farm boy uh, who was so much in love with the land and, uh, and farm work, and yet at the same time very sophisticated, both in, in political thought, 
uh, as well as being an artist. I hadn't met somebody like that uh, before, so it was, a, it was a real treat. The learning that I got from Bill in terms of understanding people and the way we stratify layers of our society around socioeconomic conditions and the way we consciously disengage people and, and disengage our hearts, uh, not only our minds, but our hearts from caring about people because they're not like us, I began to explore this much broader notion of connecting with people because of Bill. I mean, through watching him, uh, he would challenge me. But he had this great libertarian streak about him. Did not particularly want government to interfere with people's private lives. And he was a strong advocate for kind of independence and, and, and wanting to challenge conventional thought. And there wasn't anyone that he, that he didn't, uh, that he couldn't connect with, that he couldn't see for who they were and, and share the joy and love of who, who people are. And you learn from Bill in part because he challenged your mind, but he challenged your heart. And he loved Jeff like his own kid. He always said, this is as close as I'm ever going to be to having a, a child. Jeff's as close as I'm ever going to get to it. And he asked me when Jeff was very young if I minded that he disciplined Jeff and that he, if he'd do things with Jeff, if that would always be okay. And I said, why, sure, no, I don't mind at all. I, Jeff needs the influence because Jeff's father was out of the picture. And Billy Joe kind of stepped in. He, he took that part. He helped raise Jeff as if he was his very own. Uh, when I was young, I would come out. I, I came out almost every weekend, and I would, I would either stay or, on my own with Bill, or sometimes my mother would stay, but usually I would come out, and she would drop me off, and he would bring me back up, or they'd meet halfway for a cup of coffee. And so I spent a lot of time out here when I was growing up. I would go down to the creek on my own, hike around, climb in the trees, get in as much trouble as you can. We might bale hay one day, go to the, uh, go out in the fields, feed the cows, kicking hay down the hill. <laughs> he taught me how to raise tobacco. You know, they were from pulling plants to hanging it in the barns, which is the worst part of everything. And to make everything as fun as you possibly can. No matter how hard the job is, just make it fun kind of like a father figure most of my life. And then as I got older, he became more of a friend, someone I could talk to about anything and everything. He and I went to Spokane, Washington, took the train into Glacier in Montana, spent, I believe it was a week there. And that was one of my most treasured memories of him is the time we spent out there. We stayed in a cabin, hiked on trails, met a lot of people, saw a lot of scenery. It was a whole different environment for me. I'd never been, you know, out of that area. He kept it comfortable for me. Jeff, when he got old enough, Billy told him that he was gay, and it was just like... <laughs> and he said, well, how would you feel about it if I told you that I was gay? And I said, it wouldn't make the least bit of difference. And he said, well... <laughs> I mean, that's really a pretty small part of a person's life, whether they're gay or straight or, you know. It just doesn't matter. He was just a wonderful father figure to Jeff. I was always very proud of him, and I would talk about him anytime I got a chance. And the, the least bit related to him would come up. Well, he gave me a set of values to live by. To me, it's a pretty high standard to live up to. And he'd spend a lot of time showing me things, how to do everything. And that patience is something that not everybody is able to do. Living up to that standard is something I have to think about on a regular basis. I, I try to live the way that I think that he would like me to live, and raise my kids the way that he helped to raise me, and try to be a kid because that was the other thing that he was very good at being, was being a kid. Bill developed into um, not only what we would say is a griptrician, somebody who helped set up grip equipment and lighting equipment, but uh, became very adept at 
uh, being a dolly grip. We carried a dolly that was about 400 pounds, I believe. Her name is Greta. And Greta went a lot of places, upstairs, downstairs, through narrow doorways. She was a well-traveled girl. <laughs> Pushing a dolly when you're trying to integrate camera movement uh, into the action of, uh, of a scene uh, can become a very sensitive. It's like being an actor. And Bill had, not only because of his strength being able to move the platform, uh, but because of his sensitivity and understanding what I was going for could get me to the place I needed to be, right on the mark, right at the right moment. And that's quite a, an interesting art. Scene one, Apple take two. We always used to joke, you know, we've done 10,000 miles on this shoot, uh, three feet at a time. I think the memory of Bill on the road was just the joy of having this uh, camaraderie of really, really interesting and neat and diverse people. Uh, we had a great time everywhere we went. The restaurants, the job, at night, it was just great fun. Those were incredibly interesting and fun years. Uh, he was quite a, uh, a Pied Piper to get us all to go down to the farm to help him uh, work on a farm. I thought it, he was, um, you know, he was a good politician in making it sound like it'd be just the most fun activity that you could possibly want to do, baling hay or whatever, you know. It was hard work. Well, when you house tobacco, the best place to be is up on the top because you don't have to handle as much. And the worst place to be is on the wagon where you have to handle it all. So that's pretty much uh, the bottom line in housing tobacco. I had never done anything like that, of course, and um, I never realized how you housed it. You're tiered, you know, you're, everyone's working together. You're like a human ladder, throwing that stuff up. It was fun. If I were doing it with people I didn't know, I'd hate it. But the fact that I was doing it with friends, it was fun. We had fun working. We worked hard, but we had fun. And I'll never, ever forget that. It'd be hot, and uh, we'd just jump in the creek. Everybody jump in the creek. Down in the bottom, hotter than hell out here. We'd jump, we'd take our clothes off and jump in the creek. Get cooled off, get back up and get that hoe and start chopping those weeds out of that field pretty soon. Over we go again into the creek. Good times. The sense of freedom. Even though you know you've got a lot of work to do and it seems almost impossible that you could ever get it done. I'll tell you one thing, he was a worker, wasn't he? He was a worker. The neighbor across the road, Anna Lee, she always was there helping us. And she played the guitar. And uh, she'd bring her guitar to the field and she'd play songs. And the day we all stripped to go in the creek, she looked at me and she said, are you gonna take your clothes off? You just worked hard. You sweat hard, you eat. And that's why the food was so good up at the house. You know, you were hungry and you were sweaty and... It was neat. Everybody got to learn about what it's like to do a little work in the country. Well, one morning, you know, we're up there, his dad's calling down, ah, oh, Billy, Billy Joe, get up here. That damn bull got out of his blah, blah, blah. You know, I didn't, you know, so Bill says, you know, get your muck mucks on or whatever. I mean, I had that. You have a whole another life down here. So we put all of our farm clothes on because you just get a mess. So we drive up there, and sure enough, there he is. And they went that way down the road. So sure enough, he's in front of Anna Lee's house. And uh, Bill says, okay, you go down at the other side of the, down at the other end of the road. I'm gonna get the bug and I'm gonna drive it to him and he's gonna come running at you. But you just stay where you are because it'll jump over the fence. So, he's, so he does do this, by the way. He takes the bug, the bull starts chomp, you know, charging down the street. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do it. His dad was in there laughing his head off. I'm sure of it. So the bull's coming at me, and I'm getting ready to run the other direction. And sure enough, the bull did jump the fence and be where he was supposed to be. That was the funny story. Though. But honestly, that daggone heifer with the infected udder was the worst experience for a month for me. <laughs> that was awful. It was good. It was a good time. Oh, Christmas was great. 
It was a celebration of life, which was the farm always was a celebration of life. But it was Christmas time, and it was especially neat. It was so sweet, you know. It was like the birth of Christ and the birth of friendship. We used to at Christmas time go and get a Christmas tree every year. It'd just be one of those red cedars, as they call them, and we'd make a event of going up, chopping down the tree and bringing it down, and then well, we used to trim the tree early in the day. We always had a good time getting everything together, and then people would come from all kinds of places. And everybody that came to Bill's house, although I didn't know them all, he knew them all, and it always seemed to me that he knew them all well. Everything meshed very nicely. He just had a way of making everybody be comfortable and just drew all kinds of people to him. And we got here and the farm was just packed with cars and it was also a night that it was, there was an ice storm. So everything was just crystallized. The trees, the cars, the bushes, the house, everything had this sheen to it. I, I, I'll never forget that. Everything was so new and shiny that night because everything was shiny. Everything was just icy because you saw it all the time because anytime you had to go to the bathroom, outside you had to go. Well, he'd get this big log every year. I remember the log, everything tied to it. They, they're throwing it into the fireplace and just making all the negativity and the bad wishes of the year burn up. And everybody would put something on and then put it in there and then we'd watch the log for a little while and then we'd start singing the Christmas carols. People just really came out of their shells out here on the farm, it seems. When you were at Bill's house, you were just comfortable and doing fun things. He was full of love. That's his best attribute. And a happy new year. He loved fishing. I like fishing. We'd go out to the Outer Banks and fish, and uh, offshore stuff, a lot of times in the fall. And the fishing was good. Camp out. Set up a camp. There's so many memories, you know, that you can't begin to say them all or to write them all. You know, it, it, there was just too many, and too many good ones, and mostly good ones, mostly good ones. Oh, well, the big thing up at the farm was Fourth of July. Bill loved fireworks. And Bill's father loved fireworks. I'm talking about the <laughs> firecrackers. The M80s. Oh, yeah, I handed them around, they blew them off. They blew, they blew them off. At the 4th of July, he was just like a little kid. And, and what was beautiful about that, it was, once again, it was a contrast. You know, he, here, here's this very unconventional person just lighting up about the 4th of July and the fireworks. The cousins from the city would come out and the neighbors would come, and the friends would come. And during the 4th of July, occasionally some people from down the road would come in, they'd play guitar, and they would sing. And you had this incredible mix of people. You know, you had his gay friends, you had these very conventional farmer types, you had family folks, and some who I'm sure were very conservative, some were very liberal, and, you know, he would just mix all these people up, you know. You know, I mean, it was about as Americana as you could get, man. You know, it was, it, it was really special stuff. And every 4th of July, we had those fireworks. <laughs> the old wagons would go out in front of the house, the old uh, tobacco wagons, you know, the big old flat wooden wagons with wheel, four wheels on them. And they would be the launch pads. And the fireworks would come out, and Mr. Petrie would get his seat, and the family would line the big front yard. And Mrs. Petrie would be out there, and all the cousins and aunts and uncles and all the kids, tons of kids. It was a celebration of life uh, every 4th of July. And so it was a special time. It was a special time. Then, at the end of it, was all the kids jumped in. <laughs> And all the adults and the children all walked around with like sparklers in their hand and we all, we all sang. One of his last requests of us when we gather with the farm and we tell tales, we share letters 
but that we shoot off fireworks. So every time I see fireworks, I feel a real connection to Bill Petrie. Uh, he was in his studio. He was working on, on uh, the ceiling. He was putting up those um, four by eights on the ceiling. I had a job in town. Bill decided he would work by himself. Of course, didn't wait for help and was putting him up and the ladder slipped. He went down 20 feet, landed on his knees. He couldn't reach us, so he called the neighbor and she took him to the doctor. Betty and Norma, terrific neighbors, dropped what they were doing, took him to the doctor. She took x-rays and said that he had pulled a lot of the ligaments, tendons in his knee, and that she would give him medication for inflammation. She then proceeded to give him sample medication as a favor. And she went to the drug room and brought back an open box with six bottles, all the same color top. And you know, he was calling me, because we talked just about every night on the phone, and he was saying how it made him so giddy, and we just kind of attributed it to being pain medicine. But I never reached into a box where I pulled one out of 10 different possible bottles, which turned out to be the improper medicine, and went into a diabetic coma. All of us were in a state of shock. It, it's mind-boggling. He was airlifted to Lexington Hospital. I don't think the hospital was really prepared for the hundreds, and I mean really hundreds of people who came to pay respects and to visit with him and to spend just those few minutes um, conversing. I have never, ever been around people that good that cared that much, that were there for us. They did everything they could for us. They got our food. They just did everything uh, to help us through this. And when I would go to the room where Billy was, it was so quiet. And I kept saying to him, are you still here? Or are you gone? I said, what, if you are here, you know we're here with you. I love you. I hope someday we meet again. I had worked in a hospital. I was working at Christ Hospital when I met Bill. So, I mean, it wasn't like I was adverse to the hospital situation, wasn't adverse to seeing him in the condition he was in. It didn't, that was not a freak out. Um, because, as I said, I just wanted things to get better, and I knew they would if I kept rubbing his feet long enough. They were going to get better. And, um... Yeah, that was, that was, um... And his reflex of eating ice chips made, made a real good play on your brain because you just wanted everything to get better, and you thought it was. So I, you know, the, a few days later he, had, he passed away. So that was just life there for a week. That was just life, and then it was over and life changed. Well, in Lexington, 
the gallery hop is quite a big deal. It's a place where new artists get introduced and established artists also show their work. And it was incredible that Bill had never had a show at gallery hop. Actually, it was, it was emotionally overwhelming uh, to, to actually be involved in the process of, of going through these photographs and these personal effects of Bill's because most of these things I had never seen. And I think what it helped do is to show me the real pieces of the stories that many of the paintings are reflections of. And Bill always told stories. And they're magnificent stories. And the paintings on their own are fun and interesting if you don't know the stories. But of course, knowing Bill, for anyone who does know Bill, you know many of the stories, or some of the stories, or enough to have this, this very uh, candid perspective of the life behind some of the works. And many of the things that I saw, I never realized that they were really founded in uh, some of the photographs, some of the experiences that Bill had, uh, I guess, in part, I assume that some of them were simply culled from his imagination, uh, but in the process of setting up these cases, I came to understand that much more of his work reflected the actual life that he led and the people that he touched, uh, more so than I ever, I ever realized. Well, it was, it was a great way to introduce Bill to a lot of people that didn't know much about his work. And uh, a lot of folks were impressed because they just had never been exposed to his work. The reaction was very positive, I thought, for people that, that saw his work. Even some of those that had been exposed to some of his work but hadn't seen, say, all the paintings and so forth, all the, all the other material that was there, uh, they, you know, they were pleased to find out a lot more about Bill. I fell in love with them the first time I saw them because they're so, to me, so real. There is a realness to them in, in, in what he is about and what the paintings are about. Not in, not in the way that they are depicted or the way that they are painted, but in their subject matter and just the, the essence of them. Their stories about life and I think people see their own lives in them, and so that makes them easy to relate to. And I was very gratified and pleased to see the turnout, people who had never seen his work or who had no idea who Bill Petrie was, uh, to gather and to look and to admire what this man had created. Um, it, was, it was quite an evening. It's sad to put out the candles in the gallery to stand there with like dust and dirt on the floor and start taking down the, the pictures because you know they'll probably never be put back together again, never assembled again. As much as people would like to think that, uh, that this is the beginning of uh, some kind of uh, establishment of Bill and his artwork, it's probably not, you know. It's probably, if anybody remembers it, uh, that would be nice. But you know, that our only job was to 
put it together this one time to, to, to try and uh, uh, establish Bill's uh, life and his symbols in the community that he lived and loved in. My experience with Bill is one of love. That inner joy that had always been in me, the wonderful, wonderful times I had with him and all the doors he opened for me and all the things I learned from him. And it was always an ongoing thing, our relationship was, that we were always learning the new things and just always discussing stuff and talking. I don't think I ever really quite got over that. I still, every day I still miss him and I wish I could talk to him about things that are going on in my life or that I have done, decisions I've made that maybe I wouldn't have made if I'd been able to talk to him. And he place his hand, you know, on my heart, and he'd, you know, he'd say, listen to your heart, follow your heart, because it knows, it knows your soul. Bill's greatest strength as an artist and as a man was simply being Bill, because it is that persona that saw the world and put it on canvas. It is that persona that people fell in love with. It is that persona that people wanted to spend time with. I thought he had a lot of courage. Uh, and, and this is what he valued, this is what he emphasized, personal individual courage. He opened up my mind in areas that some areas weren't as open. He gave me his blessing, I think, is probably the most important thing that he's given me. He is one of the people that have made me who I am and so you know Bill because you know me. All that's in me from all those years I had with him and nobody can ever take that away from me and that's what I remember most about him is all the things that I would have never experienced, all the fun I would have never had, all the joy I would have never had if he hadn't been there because he was always just so much fun. He knew how to play, he knew how to play. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be alive and to be here a little longer so that I can share with, with you and with, with as many people as I can the joy that knowing Bill has been for me and the revelation of that love. And that, that makes his life so important, not just to me, but to everybody I touch because the love continues.